Right, okay, well, uh, I am uh, exposed before you as a noisy nodder. I hope I have some fellow noisy nodders in the room. Um, I feel quite shy now. <laughs> um, right, okay, so I've got a clicker over here. Let me go find the clicker and then I can take you through what I want to talk to you about. Um, the team up there are fantastic, by the way. They've uh, really got me down pat, noisy nodding, yes. One of them said to me, you're a very expressive speaker, aren't you? There's lots of arm movement, there's some intensity here. The guy in the front row cannot feel safe right now. How are you, how are you doing down there? You're okay. He's up next, by the way. Um, so, let me uh, crack on into it. I'm clicking. I'm clicking. I'm even clicking the green button. Do I need to be pointing down here? Oh, no, I've gone too far now. It's now caught up with me. You can see that's a preview for you. Right, this is what we're doing. Beyond open. Because we have so much further to go than open banking. Right? Uh, everybody is kind of excited about open banking. Yeah. Um, and everybody is thinking, OK, maybe the UK is, is doing something interesting in this regard. Maybe, maybe. Um, but what I want to talk to you about is using that as a launch pad, thinking about open banking, absolutely. But we need to go beyond that. We need to go to open data. We need to go to our open future. Because what we're really talking about, and you saw this throughout the day yesterday, people at the back standing up, come in, sit down, be welcome. Thank you. Um, uh, we're talking about a world which is enabled by data to deliver hyper-personalized, predictive, and preemptive service. I want you to understand that that means the death of big, dumb products, mass marketed without consideration to the end consumer. So we're going beyond open banking, we're moving into open data, we're moving into our open future. And one of the things that um, we're really going to capture is uh, what this actually means for the oft abused, much misunderstood concept of trust. We heard the word trust a lot yesterday. Uh, and I'm going to present, as Adam said, I'm going to present some material to you, uh, which is genuine, uh, first time it's ever been seen, first time it's ever been done, uh, research around this. And my job today is to make uh, you think. So it's not that I'm up here talking and you're sitting down there uh, ignoring the apples in the middle of the table. Nobody's eaten an apple yet. It's very disturbing to me. Um, my job is to make you think and to leave you with slightly awkward thoughts in your heads that just won't go away. Some questions that you need to ask yourselves, some things that you need to consider doing. So that's the transaction today, and I'd like some very noisy nodding. Um, so uh, we're going beyond open. Uh, Adam introduced me. This is my full disclosure. These are the different things that I do. So creating disruption, he was very kind, he said creating positive disruption. Not everybody always sees disruption as positive, the intent might be. Uh, but I've worked on a lot of legislation and regulation in the UK, uh, been in and around open banking since before it was a thing. Um, the aspiration, the ambition for open banking is currently uh, unrealized, right? The ambition is far greater, the ambition has a social impact, the ambition has an economic impact. Uh, so creating disruption, coping with disruption, and exploiting disruption. The red thread through everything that I do is data. Open data, but also accessible data. Structured data, but also unstructured data. So the data that we capture and we hold in our databases and that we understand about people, like the trail of information that I leave behind me with my transaction history, which would be liberated by open banking, but also all of the data out there in the wild, text, images, audio, video. Very important, huge wealth of data which is available to us and fundamentally unexploited. Um, the oft-abused commodity of trust is going to come through as a red thread here. Um, because it's much misunderstood, uh, and I want to shed some light on it. Uh, but let's start um, in, our, in our conversation today. 
uh, open banking, you know, how did we get here? Open data, how did we get here? Where are we going? And what does it all mean for trust? So I always use this picture to try and explain the swirling um, drivers of change that we're all experiencing right now. Because there are several really strong drivers of change which are interrelated, and only one of them is regulatory in nature, and it is the least interesting driver of change. Number one driver of change, and we heard a lot about this yesterday, is people's attitudes, behaviors, and expectations. And remember, as individuals, our attitudes, behaviors, and expectations are being shaped for us um, by large, data-obsessed, tech-enabled organizations, whether that's GAFA, whether it's WeChat. Um, we heard a lot about it yesterday. I won't, I won't go into that in any more detail. We, we heard it yesterday. But what it's delivering for us as individuals is an expectation of service. Not a big, dumb product, mass-marketed us without consideration. Service. Service that we might need, service that we might want, service that is enjoyable by extension, therefore, service which is pleasurable. We don't often equate financial services with pleasure, but I want you to go there, because you're going there in other aspects of your life. You're expecting service to be pleasurable. It's one of the things that you talk about a lot. You know, was the service good? Did you like the service? Um, we're no longer satisfied by just being eligible for a product. That's no longer a big tick in anybody's box. Second driver of change is obviously there's mass proliferation of data and the accessibility of that data. Um, structured data, obviously the data that's being released by open banking, of course. Um, we can now use that uh, to power the services that we want to access. Very interesting. Um, but is this publicly available, unstructured data? And also the data that you have as organizations in your internal treasure troves, whether that's customer satisfaction type data, interactions with your customers, you know, transcripts from your uh, calls with customers, whether it's the way that you're discussed uh, publicly and socially by your customers, by your staff. Uh, how you're reviewed, all of these things. Now, publicly accessible, you've got the data treasure troves internally, and it's about unleashing both types of data, structured data and unstructured data. Obviously, uh, we've got a third massive driver of change, which is the uh, proliferation of uh, competitors coming into the space. And uh, yes, there are incumbents that are absolutely upping their game in this regard. Partnering, partnering really well, developing an ecosystem around them. Uh, so we've obviously got the tech titans and the, uh, the partnership ecosystems they set up around themselves. We've got the big incumbents, as I just mentioned. We've got challenges. Uh, we've got you know, the fintechs and so on. Um, my observation about this range of competitors is that there are some which are very holistic in their understanding of their consumers um, and very uh, extensive in the services they're delivering to those consumers. And there are some organizations out there which are really focused on solving point solution, you know, creating point solutions, solving single issues. My word of warning for those organizations is, uh, if that's all you're doing, effectively, in the broken journeys that we all go through today, you are tarmacking the goat track, right? Nothing more profound than that. So the question when you're thinking about what is the uh, business that we're in and how do we as a larger organization build around ourselves an ecosystem uh, of partnerships that uh, is accretive to our consumers, to our customers, 
How are we reinventing what it is that we do to deliver that hyper-personalized predictive and preemptive service rather than patching what is currently broken with point solutions? Um, so that's the third driver of change that uh, we're experiencing. The fourth and the least interesting is regulation. Why is regulation the least interesting? Because it's what you get when you ignore those other three drivers of change. You get regulation as a kind of punishment when you've ignored uh, people, their attitudes, their behaviors, their expectations, when you fail to leverage uh, data, you've hidden it, hoarded it, never ever looked at it. Uh, and when you've denied, been in a deep state of denial about your competition, you get regulation as a kind of punishment move. Um, and it quite often has a very unintended consequence. And that unintended consequence is kind of the anaphylactic shock of rejection which is where you know, your compliance people get involved and compliance becomes your driving force. And any organization which is run by one vested interest is, is a weakened organization, which is why I say regulation is um, uh, often problematic. And if you want to just think about um, open banking in the UK and some of the problems that we've had with it, which were well known right from the very beginning, is that the, kind of the, the open banking uh, regulation, the way it was written and the way it was interpreted, uh, has given carte blanche to uh, those kind of tech fetishists who think the answer is always an API specification. When you think about what open banking was intended to do, which has have a societal impact, which has have an economic impact, um, to get finance to those uh, to, to, to you know, financial inclusion, for both for consumers and critically for small businesses. And it gets collapsed down into the specifications of a plug and a socket for moving data. That's how you limit something. Um, so I think there's uh, more, uh, JP Morgan came out yesterday to say there's more open banking happening in the corporate space in the US uh, than there is in the whole of Europe. Um, so just, just think about that. Regulation is your least important uh, driver. It just gets a lot of attention. Um, so I now want you to um, imagine yourselves as uh, flowers. Okay, some people are more comfortable with that. This guy down at the front, he's very comfortable with that one. He's like, I am a flower. I am that flower. Yeah, right there. Okay, um, so imagine yourselves as flowers. The flower I'd like you to imagine yourself as, uh, everyone stop taking notes now, it's like I'm not writing this down. The, the flower I'd like you to imagine yourself as is a daisy. Everyone's looking at the daisy, going, is that me? Is that, is that you? That's, that, that's pretty much a portrait, right? <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, Right, so imagine yourself as a daisy. Why is a daisy a really useful uh, metaphor for us here? The yellow bit right in the middle is your identity, is who you are, is how you access things. And every petal around the edge of it, imagine that as a petal of data that you can plug in to access the services you want to access. So at the moment, um, your personal uh, data daisy does not look as full and as healthy uh, and as vibrant as this particular daisy. It might have a couple of petals that you can plug in. You can plug in your location, for example. Uh, open banking will allow you to plug in your current account, and then, by extension, savings accounts, uh, uh, credit cards. Uh, ultimately, we'll get to the point of insurance, uh, pensions, uh, maybe even, if you want to get dystopian about it, uh, health, and so on and so forth. So think of all of the different petals of data that you create with your behavior that under a principle of open data, you'll be able to leverage to access the services uh, you want to access. Starts to become more interesting, because the more petals of data you can plug in, the more hyper-personalized, predictive, and preemptive the services you can power. It allows you to do something to broker today and tomorrow, fast money and slow money. Fast money, the money you want to spend today, on 
get in that cab, the coffee, the, you know, whatever it is you need to buy. Uh, longer term uh, goals and responsibilities like rent or mortgage or insurance, even longer term pensions, social care, uh, responsibilities to your children, to your family. So if you can broker today and tomorrow and later life, and you can wrap around yourself access to services which are hyper-personalized, predictive, and preemptive, you're leveraging as a consumer or as a small business, even as a large corporate, uh, you're leveraging your data to access services which are pertinent to you, relevant to you, interesting to you, valuable to you, and I would argue pleasurable to you. Again, pleasure is very, very important as a human uh, driver. <clears throat> what this means is the death of the big, dumb product mass marketed without consideration for the end customer ceases to be relevant, ceases to be relevant to the individual. One size does not fit all, one size fits no one at all. The interesting thing about this daisy as a metaphor, obviously it puts the consumer in charge. That's interesting. But it also um, flips uh, what data is. Data has been company-owned, static, uh, and uh, inaccessible. Data now becomes highly dynamic, consumer-owned, and uh, a weapon of choice. So quite a profound change in the nature of that data. It also puts the consumer in charge in a very, very powerful way, because if they no longer want to give you access to their data, they can cut off that data supply, which cuts off your service, which terminates your revenue stream. So a very, very simple uh, 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 and obvious example. Um, if you are prepared to share your location data with Uber, Uber can come and get you, right? Because you tell it what you want, and then you tell it where you are, and it takes you to where you want to go. If you don't, if you lose trust in that organization, you turn off your location access to that app, you may even delete the app, and you've cut off Uber's ability to deliver that service, you've cut off Uber's revenue stream. So it is no longer about uh, just um, this monolithic uh, entity called trust. Trust is a highly dynamic and socially negotiated concept. And you can't deliver hyper-personalized, predictive and preemptive service without a very sophisticated understanding of how trust is constructed, how it's negotiated, how dynamic that concept is, and actually without understanding really what creates trust and how trust is being received and how trust is being understood. Um, so what I want to do now, um, Adam very kindly mentioned that I was going to be sharing some research with you. And um, the reason uh, the company in question, uh, Signoy, uh, decided uh, to do this research was to demonstrate the capability of the technology uh, they've, they've built. Um, and they wanted to take a very difficult, tricky, slippery, uh, malleable, changing concept like trust to demonstrate what it was they could do. Um, I was paying, as, as, as Adam said, uh, you know, very close attention yesterday, and I counted just over 36,000 mentions of the word trust. So I thought, everybody here is very familiar with the word. So we're going to do a little bit of audience participation here. This is off the cuff. Uh, raise your hand if you think you understand what trust means. Okay, we've got a very confident man here at the front, in the blue shirt. And I saw some other hands, I'm still waving at me, thank you, sir. Did, did everyone, does everyone go, nope, nope, don't understand that one, 
don't understand it at all. Hands up if you do not understand the concept of trust. Okay, that would lead you to conclude that trust is some kind of monolithic, uh, enduring, uh, simple and universally understood thing. Oh no, don't yawn, sir. Are you back with me in the room? Are you with me? Thank you. Um, that idea that it might be a simple or enduring uh, concept is an absolute myth, actually. Uh, so what I want to share with you is uh, the research that this company, Signoid, did. Um, and they think of it uh, in the terms of it being part of the cultural uh, weather. So before we get into the research, I'll explain what I mean uh, by the cultural weather, and then I'll get into the depth of what they've done and, and why, why I think it's very relevant for you. Um, so cultural weather, often you know, shorthand called the zeitgeist, uh, the ebb and flow of the cultural atmosphere that surrounds us and shapes us, actually. Um, and, this, and you know this changes, right? It changes over time. Things that feel appropriate to us now did not feel appropriate to us in the past. Or things that felt very appropriate to us uh, a few months or years ago no longer feel appropriate to us now. This is the cultural weather. It's changing, it's morphing all of the time. So it's the discourse that surrounds us. And interestingly, crucially, and very importantly, it is the trail that we leave uh, by the words that we use, the images that we create, uh, the audio, uh, the video. Um, so all of that unstructured data out in the world which we use to define who we are uh, and um, what matters to us. There's a great deal of unstructured information out there, uh, which is this uh, go goes to create this concept of cultural uh, weather. So it's created and expressed uh, by individuals, by companies, uh, by you know, uh, governments, um, <laughs> technical term alert, at a rate of gazillions of items uh, every single second. So I want you to get a sense of proliferation here, enormous uh, tsunami of information. So that's why it's hard to understand. So how do you understand it? Um, so what Signo has done, it, it was really curious about this capability, uh, this, this need to understand large-scale, unstructured data. The thing that puts your data daisy in context, right? Because it's no longer just about you, it's about you in context. Um, so they built the technology platform to be able to understand unstructured data at pace and scale. Um, so, what, so let's get into what they did, and this is why I think it's so important for you to understand uh, what it is that they've done. Most research that you read uh, will be small scale and highly structured. So we asked 1,000 people, we asked them 10 to 20 questions, we asked them on a scale of 1 to 10, how do you feel about this thing? What if you could synthesize from millions of publicly available data points, like panning for gold, what if you could synthesize down to a reasonably contained data set? In this case, what they did was just under 300,000 data points. Um, to understand how this commodity of trust uh, was being discussed, being interpreted, being understood, and being acted upon by people today. This, this research covers Australia, it also covers uh, the UK and uh, the US. So what they did was monthly qualitative research at scale, asking people questions like, um, what does it feel like to you when you trust an organization or you trust the services or products that they deliver? What does that feel like to you? Conversely, what does it feel like to you when a company doesn't earn your trust or you, they lose your trust through the experiences you have with them. What does that feel like? That gives you a language set to understand what it is that trust means in different cohorts, different ages, different geographies, different socioeconomic groups. You then use that language set, that parole, 
to unlock huge quantities of publicly available data. And then you pan for gold, pan for gold, pan for gold, till you get down to that uh, contained data set of just under 300,000 uh, items. Now, what they're going to do is they're going to ingest uh, company websites, they're going to ingest news flows, so they're going to build this up over the next year. So this is the first trawl of what it is that they found. And what I'm going to introduce you to is uh, some very strong, dominant codes around trust. And then I'm going to talk to you about the codes which are emerging. And what I want you to think about is how am I building my business? Am I building my business on the dominant codes of trust, or am I building my business to allow for, to enable future codes of trust? And hopefully this will give some context to all of the great material that you heard yesterday, where the word trust was used a very, very great deal. So the, and then there's going to be an audience participation bit when, I, when I'm taking you through these uh, different codes where I'm going to ask you where you think you're building your business. So I'm not springing the on, this, on this on you. I'm, I'm asking you to think about it. And I'm going to be giving you some questions that you need to ask yourselves. And I'm giving you some things that you might want to think about doing. So what are the dominant codes of trust? And it does vary by geography. It does vary by socioeconomic group. It does vary by age cohort. So I'm just going to give you a, a preview here at the moment. So the dominant codes of trust, six of them came through. There are more out there, obviously. These are the six top dominant codes of trust. As I looked at this research as it came in, I thought, absolutely nothing here surprises me. Digital security, telling the truth, treating people well, ethics and leadership, service that works, doing the right thing. I didn't think any of these were remotely surprising. Is anybody here surprised by those? No, I'm, I'm looking carefully, I'm looking carefully, I'm looking carefully, I'm looking carefully. No, nobody's surprised. OK. You're probably experiencing those codes on a daily basis. In the businesses that you interact with, uh, the way that your consumers are interacting with you. That's how you're expressing the things they interpret as trust. And as such, that's good, right? These are the dominant codes of trust. But what happens, because this is the cultural weather, right? It morphs, it, morphs, it changes, it fluxes. What happens is that codes emerge, they then dominate, and they then die. So how many of these codes are on the downward slope of dominance? How many of these are actually residual, dying codes? That's the thing to really think about. You know, am I building my business on something which is going to be strong, stable ground for us in the trust context for a long period of time? Or actually, am I, am I on the tail end of some of these? So what's really interesting is um, that this is coming out from the data. It's being revealed by the data. It's not, uh, nobody's gone and asked a direct question. Because when you ask a direct question, if I were to ask you a direct question right now, I'd be asking that question in such a way that I can engineer an answer to that question, and I can satisfy myself that I'm right. It's quite unnerving to just allow the answer to be revealed by the data. Uh, it is also quite unarguable. So here are the emerging uh, codes of trust. And I'm going to give you an overview of all six, but I'll deep dive into three of them where I really want you to think about them. So these are the emerging codes coming up very, very clearly. Two-way transparency. This is one of the ones that I'll go into a little bit more detail on but it is the expectation of openness. More openness than older cohorts, which are typically running companies now, are, are comfortable with. Uh, my money, my data, I mean, we've covered this a great deal over the last couple of days. This will surprise nobody in the room. But the expectation that I own, my data that companies hold on me, it's mine, it has value. It's out there in the world as a context. 
And that's the bit I really want you to think about. It is out there in the world as a context. This is not an open banking thing that we can keep under wraps. Right? There is an expectation in other areas of people's lives that my data is mine, particularly strong, as you would expect, in the Gen uh, Z area, but percolating up through millennials as well. Agency, one of the ones I'll go into a deeper dive on. Uh, this is the idea that the world is really freighted with uncertainty, um, but those brands, those companies, those services uh, that offer consumers uh, control agency uh, have an advantage, have a strategic advantage. Uh, local authenticity, I'll, I'll also go in th into this one in a little bit more detail as well. Um, but this isn't the uh, kind of idea that there's some great big you know, brand purpose. Uh, this is the idea that what really lands with people, uh, resonates with people, is this uh, what you're doing in my local uh, area, what you're doing in my kind of the square meters that I, 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 I occupy. I'll go into that one in more detail. Social exchange, uh, really quite a scary one for companies, but again, coming through very, very strongly. And this is where brands have typically been very um, nervous about taking some overt political stance, because uh, it can go very well and it can go very badly. And you have to tread that line very, very uh, carefully. Um, but this idea of social exchange, I'll give you a couple of examples. One um, uh, which went um, arguably fairly well and was very uh, relevant to the company in question, and one which absolutely tanked. Uh, so Nike um, has for many, many years uh, run with their tag about just do it. And uh, I'm going to mispronounce his name. I don't know how to pronounce his name properly. But Colin uh, Kaepernick, uh, the uh, American football player who uh, took a knee during the, uh, during the playing of the national anthem as a recognition uh, that was widely understood of um, uh, the uh, race implications in America. Uh, so he would take a knee, he would literally kneel during the uh, national, uh, national anthem. Uh, Nike ran an advert with him, which uh, was very striking. It was a picture of this guy's face, um, black and white image with his, you know, his eyes boring out into you, uh, saying the words, uh, believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. And that was uh, the way that that was interpreted uh, by the cohort Ni Nike was seeking to uh, engage with uh, was absolutely this uh, speaks to this idea of social exchange. Uh, an, an example of one a big brand that uh, you're probably familiar with that got it completely and awfully terribly, uh, uh, terribly wrong was Pepsi when they ran an advert with Kendall Jenner. Uh, who's a member of the Kardashian family, um, uh, where she breaks out of a uh, makeup ad and stops a protest uh, by handing a can of Pepsi to a police officer. This went very, 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 very badly wrong and is an example of uh, misunderstanding and, and failing to utilize this concept of, um, of social exchange. New humanity... Um, uh, I kind of, I kind of blame AI, right, for this. Um, we have been so keen to adopt the whole uh, powered by AI thing um, that we have forgotten in many contexts and many examples our humanity. So um, this isn't to say that you know all chatbots are wrong and it's bad and we shouldn't leverage AI. No, I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying it is, is it has to be done uh, with humanity. And how do you manage to do that? You manage to do that if you've got an agreement with your customers about them sharing their data with you 
and that you're listening to that data, whether it's just the structured data that they're creating with their behavior, or whether it's the unstructured data, which allows you to place your communication and your engagement in context. So that's an overview of those six uh, emergent codes. I want to go into three in uh, more detail in the time that we have together. So let me go through uh, two-way transparency with you. Um, so it's an example uh, quote there. I trust social media and reviews more than I trust any company. So this is the expectation of openness. So this comes through very strongly in younger cohorts. And what they're saying is, we trust companies that are willing uh, to engage in public dialogue. Uh, so this isn't about investing really heavily in marketing or advertising or comms in that kind of monolithic pumping the stuff out. Uh, this is talking about um, companies that actually really do talk to their uh, customers in public and that are quite happy to have those conversations in public because it's what these consumers are expecting. They are very suspicious if companies try and seclude those conversations. Go, oh, right, this might be a bit of a tricky conversation. I don't want to have this in public. Would you go into direct messaging with me? Or can we take this uh, into some non-public uh, forum? People are very, very suspicious about that. It's like, okay, something's dodgy. You want to hide it. Not comfortable with that. Um, so there's a very suspicious if companies want to manage that kind of brand reputation in private. So businesses that seek that privacy, and I know it's awkward when we're talking about um, financial issues, but businesses that seek that privacy are more likely to be burned on open channels, and it's those open channels that matter to new consumers. So some questions uh, you should be asking yourselves, you know, are we happy, are we really happy to have public interactions on open channels, or do we try and keep all customer interactions private? Do we respond to the comments that our customers make on open channels that our potential customers or existing base might read? Are we happy to do that? Are we really happy to do it? Do we publicly acknowledge our mistakes and take steps to put them right? How open are we? Um, younger people really value transparency. They really value the opinion of their peers. If you want to win their loyalty, you have to be out in the open, you have to be engaging. Productive, one-to-one, -one, customer-oriented way, uh, because that's about how you develop a relationship that they find uh, to be trustworthy. So the to-do here is embrace the conversation because you cannot fight uh, this particular tied. And it also makes a very interesting point about the reversion of trust here. Often, trust is talked about as something you as the company expect or hope or believe or want to grow your customers having in you. Right? Brand reputation, the trust people have about us as an organization. Actually, one of the things that you need to do, and this is back to that kind of concept of the data daisy, is you need to show you know your customers, you need to show that you understand your customers, you need to show that you're delivering that hyper-personalized predictive and preemptive service, and you need to show that you trust your customers. It's not just a big, dumb, monolithic thing that you're expecting people to feel about you. You need to demonstrate that you trust your customers. And that's quite a different way of looking at it. We are turning the trust telescope around and we are finally looking down the right end of that trust telescope. Now I want to go to um, agency. Um, constantly anxious, I need to feel life is under control, there are things you can do something about, there are things you absolutely can't. Okay, this is interesting. This is talking about uncertainty. Any organization that can offer its consumers a feeling of control, an actuality of control over their lives has an inbuilt strategic commercial advantage. 
Um, if you don't have agency, you feel powerless. That's a bad feeling to engender in your consumers. Um, people can't control the really big things which are happening out there, whether it's climate change, uh, whether in the UK it's our ongoing national shame called Brexit, or in the America, whether it's Trump. No one can control Trump. Uh, but they can seek, and they do seek, to control their lived experience. Um, and this particular code is absolutely everywhere. It is in every market, and interestingly, it is in every age cohort. Um, so what does it mean? Um, it means actively listening and responding openly to your customers. Um, uh, this shows your customers you listen and you act, and you act appropriately and individually. Your voice is listened to, your voice is considered. Uh, provide that, that honest, that straightforward advice, and advice in context of that uh, personalized service, so that that person is helped to make informed choices because then they've got that agency. Um, to, be, to be able to thrive, you've obviously got to be honest about pricing. We heard yesterday some very persuasive uh, commentary about dynamic pricing. And this is dynamic personalized pricing, right? That's where we're going with this. Um, understanding your customers' wider values. Now, that's wider in terms of your entire cohort of customers, but that's also at an individual level. Right? And that's quite a scary level of specificity for organizations used to uh, segmenting or working with personas. Personas are proxies. We need to get beyond uh, the proxy. Um, so one way in which people can achieve that agency is um, by choosing those services that fit with their wider social values, uh, whether it's you know, um, what you're doing on the ground with regard to sustainability, whether it's uh, you're employing people locally, it's how do I merge my values with the things that I consume? And this is clearly a strong emerging trend. Clarity and simplicity. Now, it's really easy to pick on terms and conditions, and again, this was one of the things that came up yesterday. Um, just look at it from the point of agency. If I make terms and conditions uh, impenetrable, if I make them legalistic in tone, uh, what I'm doing is I'm appearing, I'm actually being coercive. That's what we're doing. When we let the lawyers do that stuff, when they write it in lawyer, legalese, uh, we are effectively being coercive to our consumers. So the clearer you can be, and the more, hum hu the more humane and hum uh, the more human your language, uh, the more you are uh, giving people really clear agency over their rights and their obligations. Flexibility. Uh, I don't have agency when you tie me in to some long-term obligation, a long-term contract. Um, so it's that flexibility Sorry, don't worry, we're not going to look at you. Um, it's that long term, uh, it's always the thing I hope never happens to me, so I'm just grateful it didn't happen to me on this occasion. Um, it's this ability to offer flexibility, and this is what I'm talking about, that hyper-personalized predictive and preemptive service, where I control the service based on the data I'm willing to share with you. If I feel I can use that to deliver flexibility of service to myself in my consumption patterns, then I have agency. So those are some of the questions to ask yourself. The to-do is trust your customers. Give them agency. Allow them peace of mind. Um, next one I want to go into a deeper dive on is this point of uh, local authenticity. Because um, it's really important, very strong code. Uh, this is about kind of debunking the brand purpose stuff that we've lived with for so long and the corporate social responsibility stuff, which is so often a tick box exercise. Uh, if you make a genuine local impact, uh, you kind of make sense to the people who are consuming you. Um, 
People get the idea, they absolutely get the idea behind sustainability messaging. But what really lands with people is what they can see, feel and share directly. The sharing is very important. Um, it's not just big butch statements about carbon neutrality, for example. Um, I've got a UK example, which actually is um, quite an interesting one. Uh, the co-op bank uh, in the UK has made a very big difference in a very specific uh, local area in Manchester. And what they've been doing is every time they sell a mortgage, uh, they take uh, five pounds, so not a huge sum, but five pounds, and they put that towards Centrepoint, which is a charity in Manchester, which helps um, young people who are experiencing homelessness or, or at risk of homelessness. So it connects mortgages with homes in a way that you don't expect to make a real uh, local impact. And yes, they've got some interesting uh, statistics around this in terms of the breadth of that impact and the depth of that impact. Um, this is a, it's a very strong emergent theme, actually, and it's very tied, not just to, I gave an example of what in the UK is, is a relatively large brand, it's also strongly linked uh, to the steady growth of independent local businesses. Very strong trend there. National and global institutions are increasingly uh, distrusted from that dominant, really telling the truth perspective. Um, and people are increasingly supporting uh, those alternatives which are rooted in their local community. Very strong code here in Australia, uh, also in the UK. Strongest at the moment amongst youngest cohorts. So the questions to ask yourself, are we making grand statements that exist only on our website, or are we doing things that make a difference on the ground? Are we going through the motions just because McKinsey other consultancy firms are available, uh, told us to do, or is this self-sustainingly obvious? Is this integral to who we are and to who our customers are? Um, and this is about anchoring real initiatives, uh, tangible initiatives in real neighborhoods. And somebody's going to ask me a question about what does this mean for online businesses? Um, and if I take another example from a different industry, um, if I take an example that looks a lot like Spotify, the ultimate online experience. Uh, look at what they're doing about bringing some of their shows to uh, a location near you where you can interact with the people who make those shows. So Spotify's latest and greatest idea is uh, to get into podcasts. And what they're doing is they're bringing those podcasts uh, to the people. So an ultimate online business interacting in local neighborhoods. So I warned you there was going to be some audience participation. Um, so I want you, I've got to tell you, you've got to go to the app thingy and you've got to um, find this session. You've got to click on my head. I'm, I, there's a picture of me. And it's always slightly embarrassing because the picture of me is so much better than the reality of me. Um, here we go. It looks a lot like this. I'm building my business on. Where are you building your business? And this isn't for me to kind of uh, have a great moment and, and go, yes, you were listening. Um, I want to know, I want you to know, I want you by the clicking of that button, by the placing of your vote, I want you to be really honest with yourself. Am I building my business on the dominant codes of trust? Or am I really building in these emerging codes of trust? So this isn't for me, it isn't really for the audience at large, it is for you to be, it's a moment of honesty for you with yourself to really know what you're doing. And as a reminder of those codes of trust, are you predominantly Digital security, telling the truth, treating people well, ethics and leadership, service that works, doing the right thing. Or are you predominantly emerging codes, two-way transparency, my money, my data, agency, 
really giving your customers agency. Local authenticity, real on the ground. Social exchange. Are you demonstrating a new humanity? So dominant codes of trust, emergent codes of trust. I have merely been able in the time that we have had today to give you a skim of some of the earliest uh, findings from this report. It will grow over time. Uh, we'll release a version of this report um, in a few weeks' time, a uh, month's time, I think, uh, before Christmas. Um, but it'll grow over time because every month we're dipping into that data again. Every month we're pulling more publicly available data and we're building this asset which is about understanding how these trends are emerging. If you want access to the report, um, you just need to text your email address to that number. And the magic works, I promise. Um, some people have been texting me things like, I'd really like the report. I'm like, well, okay, we, we can't do so much with that. It needs to be your email address if you want access to this information. And I am aware that I have very uncomfortably run over slightly, um, so I apologize for that. Um, and I will now uh, leave the zone and wait for your questions to roll in. Thank you very, very much.